Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Ask an Expert session here at the IKEA Foundation. I already see a few people saying, hey, hey, hi, hey, hi there. Sarasota, hi. How's everyone doing? Thanks so much for joining us. Happy to have you here and very happy to welcome back IKEA Foundation CEO, Herr Hagenis. Herr, how are you doing today? Hi, Ryan. Doing really well, and hello everyone. Welcome back to uh, Ask an Expert. We just marked the 20th of June, which is the World Refugee Day, and uh, the IKEA Foundation, as some of you would know, has worked very closely with UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees, and many other partners for more than 10 years to help improve the lives of refugees around the world. In Europe, here in Europe and also in North America, we, we think about refugees as people that have been forced to flee their country due to conflict and persecution and have ended up in a European and in a US country, um, seeking opportunities for a new start in life. But only a very small number of the world's 26 million refugees have made it all the way to Europe. And we will unpack that in a moment. And people flee for many different reasons. It could be conflict, war and persecution, but people also flee because climate change has made it impossible for them to stay and make a living in their home country. Migrants are not the same as refugees, but we will, and we will talk more about that in a second. Nobody chooses to become a refugee. Most people would prefer to stay in the area where they grew up and make a living there, but unfortunately for them, that was not an option anymore. And most refugee situations are protected. People are prevented for years from going back to the country they love because it's not safe for them and their families. There are a lot of misconceptions about refugees, their intentions and what has caused the need for them to leave their home, leave behind their belongings and many of their loved ones to venture into the unknown. Therefore, we have um, asked two very interesting and knowledgeable guests to join us for a discussion today to shed some more light on the situation for the world's 26 million refugees. Two people that I have known for a long time and who I admire a lot for the important work that they do. So on the one hand, we have Ola Rosling, who is the president and co-founder of Gapminder Foundation, which is he founded together with his wife, Anna, and his father, Hans. And some of you will probably remember Hans' uh, legendary TED Talks, which now Ola has taken over very successfully. Since 1999, Ola has been working on the development of trend analysis software, which he was eventually acquired by Google in 2017. That's no, 2007. And in 14, 2014, Ola coined the term factfulness, and you might have already read his book, which Gapminder is now promoting in order to make the education about sustainable development less ideological and more fact-based. My other guest today is Alexander Betts. Uh, he is a professor of forced migration and international affairs and a William Golding senior fellow in politics at Brazenos College at the University of Oxford. He served as director of the Refugee Studies Center between 2014 and 17, and his research focuses mainly on refugee assistance with a focus on Africa. You might have also read one of his books or seen one of his acclaimed TED Talks. Both Ola and Alex are IKEA Foundation partners, and more recently they have worked together to fight misconceptions and inform the current narrative on refugees. So Ola and Alex, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me start with you, Ola. Let me start with you, Ola. Um, Gapminder is famous for its myth-busting work and its ignorance test. So um, together, we asked our fellow followers on social media some facts questions about the refugees last week, and, and how did they do? Well, uh, these were fact questions that Gapminder has also been asking to the public. And uh, I must say that the social media followers were much better than the public. So let me start by showing the results uh, when we asked these questions, which was also sent out uh, as a link to people who participate in this meeting. Uh, here is one of the questions and all I'm going to show four of the questions here, which all relate to refugee numbers, proportions and trends and so on. And uh, can you see my screen now? Is, is it shared? No, I should, I should share it here. There you go. So I just want to sh show the results from uh, this, uh, this survey. Yep. Okay. 
So here is, uh, if you can see my screen now, here is the first question. What share of the world population are refugees, right, of everybody? Is it 0.4% or is it 4.4% or 14%, which would actually mean roughly a billion people or more. So uh, the correct answer is 0.4%. Uh, if you answer 4%, you're imagining that, that a lot of people, actually four among hundreds, are refugees in this world, which is probably the image you get when you look in the news, right? Uh, and these are the results. When we ask this question, it's a little bit haphazard because this is a pilot study only to start investigating how correct or wrong are people about the refugee numbers. And as you can see, only a fraction of people, uh, actually less than 30% in all the countries, in, in Mexico, Japan, Germany, it's very consistent. Only a fraction answered the uh, picked the correct answer. In the majority of people's heads, there are far more refugees than in reality. And this is the, the kind of misconceptions that actually our foundation, which is an independent educational foundation, we discover these misconceptions when it comes to climate change or, or uh, economic development or education, etc. So we did this little study about refugees asking, uh, I think, 64 fact questions. And here are the four where people were really wrong. And we can clearly see how they overestimate the number of refugees as a percentage of total. Uh, when we asked this in social media in several channels, actually many of the followers answered much, much better, though roughly one third or so was, uh, were wrong, uh, just like the public in general. So the social media followers of Gapminder and IKEA Foundation actually score better than the public, but many still perceive uh, refugees to be in the hundreds of millions of the world population. Uh, here is the next question. Let me just show you. The first one showed that the number is much lower than people believe. Here is here we're asking where are the population uh, largest as a share of the country population? Is it in Lebanon, Sweden or Germany where the percent of people is highest? Correct answer, Lebanon. And this is how many picked it. This is interesting. We asked in Germany and one of the answer options is Germany. But even inside Germany, one third of the public there uh, believed that Germany is the country where the largest share of the population are refugees, which is absolutely wrong. Germany is not even on the top 10 list when it comes to refugees per capita. But the impression in media in Germany and Europe is often that Europe is the place where most of the refugees are which is really problematic if we're going to be able to help the many refugees who are not in Europe. This next question, for example, you can see that uh, we're asking in which of the regions are uh, the highest share of migrants? This is a migrant question. And uh, you can see that Oceania, for example, has the highest percentage, uh, which is the right answer. And nobody has an idea of it. So the perceptions we have of where many refugees are uh, the total number, the most are uh, in the African continent, and people were wrong about this. So in general, people are wrong about how many refugees there are totally in the world and where they are. And here is a, a last question uh, asking how long, for how long time are you a refugee? Uh, on average, uh, how many refugees have been in exile more than four years? Is it the majority, 78%, or is it roughly half, or is it only 21%? Correct answer, 78%. Many refugees have been in exile for even 20 years, coming from Afghanistan, staying in Iran, and such conflicts that are not often reported in, uh, in the European media as a major source of refugees is is actually where the numbers are the largest and where people stay for a very, very long time. And uh, th this was just a quick rough overview of the kind of results which urge us to investigate even more if, if many people are uh, actually wrong about the number of refugees, where they are and for how long time they are refugees. Then the whole debate that we're seeing on a daily basis in the news is misinformed. Even the journalists are wrong about this. When they write about refugees as being a European crisis where people are temporarily staying in a tent uh, uh, and uh, there are lots of them, 
this per this is perceived as the refugee challenge for the world, but it's a very, very skewed picture of the global refugee challenge, which is a long-term stay outside your country. And it's not in Europe. Uh, and the total number is much lower, actually, than people realize. Fascinating. And what about... Um people's attitude towards refugees. And are they welcoming? Are they, uh, I think you had a question about uh, whether people think there should be more refugees or less refugees or the same amount of refugees in, in their country, right? Yes, I, this is the part where I get really excited because I love investigating factual knowledge versus opinions. There is a assumption, roughly, whatever opinion you have about refugees in your country, uh, you will probably assume that the people who don't share your opinion are wrong about the facts, right? You hear both the pro and against side often claiming that the others are not knowledgeable and that's why they are wrong about their opinion, right? Or that's why they have the other opinion. The fascinating thing when we did this study, this is a small pilot study using Google survey online with a small online panel. So it's not super representative in any way, but the pattern was very clear that when we asked uh, the last question, let me just share that screen again so you can see the results on, uh, on this question. Uh, in your opinion, should we allow more immigrants? This was the immigrant version. We asked the same question with the word refugee, and it doesn't matter. People com constantly confuse these two concepts, but this is the immigrant version. Uh, should our country uh, welcome more, the same, or fewer? right? It's, it's roughly the three different opinions you can have on this question. And people distribute uh, uh, many in these countries, in Germany, at this point. Of course, the opinion on this question changes a lot over time, but you can see that uh, slightly more than half in the countries uh, in Germany or slightly less than half in the other countries were saying we should have fewer immigrants. And then many said roughly the same, and then a few said more. So we, we had 10 questions, the other nine questions were fact questions, and I was so excited to see if the people who were saying more immigrants and those who say fewer were one of these two teams, were they gonna be more correct about the facts? And the fascinating finding was that no, there was no connection between your opinion about immigrants or refugees in comparison to how you answered on the fact questions, which is really, really fascinating because it's such a common claim that we, we intuitively believe that opinions are driven by factual understanding. And if we inform the other side, then they will change their mind. But this is fascinating to see that independent of opinion, many people are wrong about the core proportions and the trends. So we have a discussion about opinions, which is decoupled from facts. Now we have refugees sitting in terrible situations and they need opportunity in their lives. And they are talked about, or, or people think that they are discussing these refugees, where in reality, they are discussing a, a wrongly informed idea about where they are, how long they are refugees, which doesn't help the refugees, neither if you think they should stay where they are or go elsewhere, because it's actually not talking about the real situation. So do you see this as a, as a pattern in all the other work you do as well? Because you have just more recently started focusing on refugees, but you, we've done this kind of research for, for 15 years. Yes, uh, it is a pattern uh, where people who who have opinions are often, as these questions, 90% of people are wrong about them. That's the kind of facts that we work with. We call it global misconceptions. And they are so systematic that we see them unrelated to the opinion world, but they are, have one thing in common. They live in the brain of a human body. So human brains have a tendency to exaggerate or misperceive reality in a systematic way, which is wonderful because it, it is forgiving. We are human beings and we should be very humble. All of us have the same kind of problems to keep track of facts. We exaggerate minorities. For example, we asked about seniors. How many people are 65 plus as share of the population? 
And, and uh, when we ask it globally, people exaggerate it in a similar way as with refugees and migrants. It's a kind of number which is a proportion. And seniors are discussed in the media as being a burden for the rich world. We hear about the, the older population. And any such discussion tend to explode in our head. And we believe there are far more of them than there actually are. So yes, there is a pattern. And I'm super excited about this. We live in the first time in human history when we got statistics. We actually know how many seniors there are. We know roughly how many refugees there are. So this is the first time we can compare the actual reliable statistics with the idea in people's heads. This was never possible before. Ideological fights have always existed. But this is the first time we can check ourselves. And surprisingly, we find the same misconceptions in all people independent of ideology, which is fascinating. It tells us that we need a different way to work with facts. We need to assume that we are wrong. That's the, that's the default state of mind. Well, it means that you and Gapminder will be around for a long time in the future because your work is so badly needed. Okay, uh, let me turn to Alex. Alex, uh, when you think about refugees, you think about uh, people in a very different part of the world than, uh, than Oxford and the United Kingdom. Um, clearly, most people have the wrong understanding about the global refugee issue. And if we don't really understand the challenges, well, then it will be difficult to do something about it, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'm really excited about what we've heard from Ulla and the work that the Gapminder Foundation is contributing to this area. Um, the refugee debate is very divided, it's very political, it's very media driven. And as a result, it tends to be that narratives rather than evidence shape the debate. And I think what Ulla's shown with Gapminder's pilot project is that there is systematic ignorance around many of the core facts within the refugee debate. And he's just shown that people tend to assume there are many more refugees than there actually are, assume that there are many more, particularly in Europe, North America and rich countries than is actually the case. And that the situation of refugees is a short-term situation when actually for the majority, it's a very long-term reality. And so I think that highlights for us that, that most refugees, in fact, 85% of the world's refugees are in low and middle-income countries. They're in countries in the Middle East, like Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey. For Afghans, they're in countries like Iran and Pakistan. In Africa, countries like Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia host millions of refugees. And the reality for refugees, therefore, is that they're hosted by some of the poorest countries in the world. And it's not because those poor countries are necessarily disproportionately generous. It's because of the geography of where they are, that they neighbor countries of conflict and crisis, and that when people are forced to flee across borders, they end up in those countries. Now, they end up in very different situations. Many end up in refugee camps or refugee settlements, where sometimes they don't have the right to work or even freedom of movement. But increasingly, they also end up in cities. So around the world, 61% of the world's refugees are actually in urban areas. They're not in camps, they're in cities. But that, of course, varies from region to region. So Africa has lower levels of urbanization and the majority of refugees in sub-Saharan Africa are not in cities. They're actually in, in camps and settlements. So we need to understand that this is a challenge, if you like, of pr predominantly low and middle income countries. And that doesn't trivialize the challenges in Europe and North America and the reality that many vulnerable people need the protection and assistance of countries in Europe and North America. But Gapminder's work shows that there's a systematic misunderstanding of where many of the challenges lie. Yes, it's it's really interesting. And, and you know, um, you're right. Everyone is in a very vulnerable position and they should be having the necessary protection and support. And in, in Europe and North America, we are much better equipped to provide that support. And what you are trying to do and we are trying to do is also to, to channel some of that support to the large, uh, low income, uh, large refugee hosting countries who actually would need more support. But before we go into that, um, there's a lot of different uh, words flying around here and people tend to confuse things. So, um, for example, when when Ola talked about refugees, he also talked about migrants and 
when UNHCR, the, 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 the global refugee organization, talks about displaced people, they talk about the record number of 80 million displaced. Can you unpack that for, for our uh, audience a little bit so they understand what is the difference and, and how do we uh, account for uh, the different groups of people, refugees just being one of them? Yeah, there's often a confusion around some of the statistics. Uh, every year, one of the features of World Refugee Week, the week we've just had, is that UNHCR publishes the latest statistics on the numbers of displaced people and refugees around the world. And the headline figure this year was 80 million people, more people displaced around the world than at any time on historical record. Um, but those 80 million people, uh, which would be 1% of the world's population, are not all refugees. They include what are called internally displaced people, people who are in a refugee-like situation. They may have fled conflict, they may have fled authoritarian government repression, uh, but they haven't crossed an international border. And actually it's about 26 million of those close to 80 million people who are actually refugees who have crossed an international border. So it's very important that we distinguish between refugees who have crossed an international border and internally displaced people who have not crossed an international border but face many of the same challenges. There are also other categories that are important to understand. One of the ones we particularly use in, in Europe is the category of asylum seeker. And an asylum seeker is someone who arrives in a country and seeks recognition as a refugee. They're claiming refugee status from that country and want to be recognized by that country's bureaucracy or by international organizations or that country's courts as a refugee. And so these terms are important to distinguish. And unless we understand the terms that we're using and we have clarity over the concepts, even the statistics tend to be subject to misinterpretation. So when Ulla asked what proportion of the world's um, population are refugees, and the answer he gave was close to 0.4%, that only makes sense if we've got clarity about our understanding of who is a refugee. Whereas if we're talking about displaced people, well then that number, that proportion goes up to 1%. Thank you. That makes it a little clearer and it's important to understand because uh, these people have, diff they come from different challenges. Um, let's move to um, the kind of work that you have done and the focus that you have had and we have had together for a very long time. And that's the focus on the fact that, as Ola also said, uh, refugee situations tend to be protracted and uh, the number of refugees who are protected uh, and are refugees for, for years and years and years up to an average of 20 years, uh, either in a camp and an urban setting, are, are facing significant challenges. And yet um, we often just look at that as, as a humanitarian situation and it is humanitarian, but there's a way to turn that around from being a humanitarian situation to a situation where refugees can slowly um, make a living for themselves and integrate in a new community. And, and that's the same thing for, for internally displaced people. So, so talk to me about how you uh, work on, on the issue of refugee livelihood and refugees' ability to contribute very positively to, uh, to the new country that they are um, being hosted in. Mm. So as you highlight, one of the big challenges is what are called protracted refugee situations, situations in which refugees have been in exile for at least five years, whether in camps or cities, often in some of the poorest countries in the world. And those situations are really challenging, particularly if people are in camps for five, 10, 15, 20 years in countries that may not let refugees work because they're worried about competition for jobs or scarce resources vis-a-vis -vis their citizens. They understandably prioritize uh, their own citizens in some cases, that can lead to very tragic circumstances in which people don't necessarily have clarity over their future prospects, in which humanitarian emergency aid, food, clothing, shelter, becomes the default response. And providing people who are very vulnerable with their basic needs at an emergency phase makes a lot of sense. But the problem comes when that humanitarian logic that logic of providing people food, clothing and shelter endures year after year, decade after decade, and people don't have the right to work, people don't have future prospects or the opportunity to build lives that we would aspire to. 
And so there's a need to shift our thinking from just a humanitarian logic towards a development logic. If people, as, as Ula has identified, are waiting many years, what a lot of them need is not just tents and food assistance, it's education, it's employment opportunities, it's the chance to build livelihoods and have meaningful and dignified work opportunities, not just to support themselves and their families, but also to contribute to the societies they're part of. And we know, for instance, from a lot of research that social cohesion between refugees and the communities that host them is better when refugees are perceived to contribute to the economies. We know that from psychology work and work on uh, the mental health and well-being of refugees, that when they have the chance to work and the chance to contribute, their well-being and subjective well-being are often better. So we need to look at how we respond to refugees, not just seeing vulnerabilities, but seeing capabilities, not just seeing this as a humanitarian logic, but also looking at it through a development lens. And that involves reconceptualizing how we think about solutions, that it's not enough to just offer basic needs. We need to offer livelihoods. We need to give people a chance to live um, autonomously, to have what humanitarians often call self-reliance. And I've been really excited by the work we in Oxford have been able to do with the IKEA Foundation over recent years. We do research in three countries, all in East Africa, Uganda, Kenya, and Ethiopia. And while they may seem obscure from a European perspective, just those three East African countries actually host more refugees than all 28 European Union member states combined. They host around two and a half million refugees, three of the poorest countries in the world. And they're in cities, they're in urban areas. And through our research, we've been able to look at their echoes, asking about what their needs are, but trying to understand how they contribute, understanding the businesses that they start, their entrepreneurship, their ways in which they earn incomes, and seeing how they contribute to the societies they're part of. And we found three really striking findings. We've looked at three main questions. First, what explains when refugees do better across a whole series of welfare outcomes, incomes, assets, subjective well-being, health, employment. Secondly, we've looked at when they get on better with the host community, what's called social cohesion. And thirdly, we've looked at how they make decisions to migrate onwards, uh, when they move from camps to cities, when they move to other countries in the region, or when they move onwards beyond their region to Europe or elsewhere. And what we found across all of those three questions is that education and are really important. The more we give development opportunities to refugees and the host communities, the better they do in terms of welfare outcomes, the more positively they're likely to be received by the host communities and nearby citizens. And finally, the more likely they are to be able to build lives where they are rather than resort to dangerous long journeys to Europe and other continents. So if we're looking for solutions, it has to be, yes, support the most vulnerable people, meet their basic needs, but reconceive this in a way where we're building long-term, dignified lives that are about livelihoods, economic opportunity for both refugees and the host communities. Thank you, that makes a lot of sense. So we can we can almost talk about two groups of refugees. We have the refugees who have uh, uh, entered the Euro European Union, the European countries or, or North America, and then we have the refugees who are hosted in uh, in the typical refugee hosting countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in uh, Middle East and Asia. And we will have a lot of people uh, with us today who are in the private sector, people who are individuals or private sector representatives who would like to know what can we do to help. So can you um, talk briefly about what can we do to help those who have uh, entered the European Union and what can we do, or, or United States, or what can we do to help the ones who are still in refugee hosting countries, hosting countries which are low or middle income countries with very limited resources? So business has a key role to play in this. Um, for a long time, refugees were just seen as the responsibility of governments, of international organizations or of non-governmental organizations. But actually, if really part of the solution is about meaningful work, is about creating job opportunities, entrepreneurship opportunities for refugees, creating regional development in the remote parts of the world that host refugee camps, then 
business has a very crucial role to play. It is a creator of job opportunities. It's a creator of entrepreneurship opportunities. It can play a role in regional development in host communities that are often some of the poorest regions of that to be a business case. Corporate social responsibility can play an important role. Philanthropy plays a crucial role, but there also has to be a discussion almost at boardroom level, at senior executive level, to say, how can we recognize a business link to these questions? How can refugees be seen as an asset, as contributors through work, through the labor that they offer? How can they be part of supply chains so that their businesses, their production and consumption are recognized as valuable assets? And I think that's part of the reconceptualization that can bring business to this conversation and ensure that it's part of it. Now, the role that they can play is different in the so-called rich world compared to low and middle income countries. In regions like Europe and North America, a lot of companies are providing opportunities for refugees to work. And that's a really important part of the integration process. Um, there are internship opportunities being provided by companies, job opportunities. I think about the work of Chibani Yogurt in the United States, the work of companies like H&M or Ben and Jerry's in Europe, really pioneering work to name just a few companies that are playing an active leadership role in Europe and North America to integrate refugees in labor markets. And that's very important that we have economic inclusion. It's a vehicle by which many Syrians in countries like Germany and elsewhere are integrating in the aftermath of the 2015 to 16 so-called refugee crisis. But there's also a role, a different role, to be played in many fragile regions of the world. And up to now, many companies have been reluctant to move into the difficult situations. The IKEA Foundation and indeed the IKEA company have been really pioneering in playing a leadership role in those areas. But there aren't many other companies prepared to invest in fragile regions to see the real opportunities that come from the presence of refugees for regional development, for infrastructural development, to build supply chains that can make a real difference to create sustainable opportunities, not just for refugees now, but for the increasing numbers of people who are going to be displaced by other causes like climate change. So I think there's a key message here in relation to your question, Pear, which is that business can be seen as part of the solution. It matters as much in rich countries as it does in low and middle income countries, but the challenges are ever so slightly different. Business can be part of the solution. It doesn't have to be seen as a CSR initiative. Uh, more importantly, business can see business opportunities in engaging refugees, creating jobs and, and building supply chains. So there's a lot of examples for how this has worked well for business and well for refugees. And I think that's the way we should look at it. That's the way we should focus it because then we can also scale it. Now, I'm gonna to go to a couple of questions, but before I do that, I just wanna say hi to uh, Kipara, who is uh, actually watching our live webcast from a refugee camp on, on Facebook. Good to see you. Thank you. Great to have you with us, Kipara. Uh, we have a question here, which I think it's uh, good for Ola to uh, answer. And it's a question that's coming, uh, saying that, as Capminder showed, information is not necessarily very relevant when it comes to how people think and feel about refugees. What do you think should we do in terms of storytelling to help positively influence people's attitude towards refugees? Yeah, I saw that question. I'm hesitant to claim I have an answer. <clears throat> the, uh, the attitude towards refugees, uh, if an, even in this pol politicized ideological fight against, for and against, uh, it's... Um, Often the case that both sides express uh, attitude where refugees are vulnerable people that need help. And then there is a huge disagreement about where they should be helped. Is it in Sweden or is it elsewhere, right? So most people are aware that many refugees are vulnerable and deserve humanitarian support and they need food, etc. So the fight, as I see it, is often not about whether you're actually positive for help to be provided, rather what methods should be used. And in that aspect, I, that's why we're doing this study, because I truly believe that the concept about what methods actually use are 
absolutely uh, depending on evidence for where the refugees are, what kind of lives they are living, because that pretty much explains where the help has to be provided. And there, I think the attitude to what kind of support is needed can definitely change among all the people who actually want to support refugees, which, which is a majority of people. Uh, very few are, are so arrogant that they say that refugees don't deserve any help at all. There are very few such people. It's really a fight on whether we should do it this way or that way. And in such decisions, if it comes to Corona pandemic, how to fight it, of course, evidence is the only thing we would rely on. People's opinions about Corona are not so interesting. Uh, it's, it's what works. That's the thing. And it comes down to how does the reality look? So the attitude in terms of emotions, I'm not so interested in because most people are quite nice. But many people are absolutely wrong about the evidence behind what works. Fascinating. We have another question here from Elena Langthorne. Thank you for s s stimulating the session. Um, a few questions. How, how has the pandemic affected the refugee situation? And what proportion of the 0.4% are climate change refugees? How do the speakers think the proportion of climate change refugees might change in the next decade of the UN SDGs? And Alex, you might, might want to respond to that. And, and suddenly we have a new uh, expression, climate refugees, which is, is, is relatively recent. So why don't you try to explain um, what that is and how it links to the rest of the numbers? So climate change is going to be a big driver of forced displacement um, for decades to come. Um, but let me start with your first question. The answer is that none of the 0.4% of refugees are regarded as climate change refugees. The, the term climate change refugees is a contested one um, because the definition of a refugee in international law is someone who is fleeing persecution based on race, religion, nationality, membership of a social group, or political opinion. Persecution tends to mean that traditionally they have a country that is instrumentally uh, persecuting them, is, is sort of out to get them, to put it very colloquially. Now, the definition of persecution has expanded to include people who are fleeing non-state armed actors, who are fleeing um, very weak, fragile states. But climate and climate change are not regarded as persecuting actors by governments or international law. And so climate change refugees is not regarded as a term that makes legal sense. Now, of course, more people are being displaced by climate change within their own countries and increasingly also across borders. And they will be in situations very much like refugees, but they're not recognized in the same way in international law. They're not recognized in the same way by governments. And this is a major challenge that governments will face. Do they include people affected by environmental displacement and climate change's interaction with conflict, violence, authoritarianism, water insecurity, food insecurity? Do they include those people in the category of refugees? Do they include them as a different category, also entitled to cross a border as a last resort? Those are big questions that we face as an international community. But it's very difficult for us to now redesign a definition of refugee created in international law after the Second World War because governments are not open to expanding that definition. There's a huge amount of public concern and political populism around the refugee debate. So expanding it to climate change is a very difficult and thorny question. And so that means that the proportion of climate change affected people will grow the proportion of people displaced will grow. And we don't have clear scenarios of what will look that will look like. But the World Bank has estimated that by 2050, there could be 143 million people internally displaced in their own countries as a result of the effects of climate change. And it's realistic to expect that many of those people won't be able to access their basic rights in their own country and therefore may have to cross borders. So I hope that addresses the climate change question. The, the pandemic's question is also a complicated question. Refugees are very much affected, but they're affected, I think, at three levels. First of all, by the virus itself. But what's striking is that many refugee hosting regions of the world are not necessarily as dramatically affected by the virus as other particularly richer regions of the world. The virus we know from research 
is disproportionately affecting older people and richer people for the most part as a virus. And the numbers in most refugee camps around the world are low, possibly because they're geographically isolated, um, but also because they often have younger populations. That seems to be what a lot of the consensus is. Again, that's not to trivialize the health effects, they're very serious, but the biggest effects on refugees are not from the health effect, but from two other effects. Secondly, lockdown. Lockdown is causing massive problems in cities where refugees are, often because they're excluded from basic assistance like food distribution by governments, and also in camps where international aid distribution has been very much affected. And the third area, which is the biggest effect, is going to come from the global recession. We know there's going to be a very serious economic recession as a result of both the virus, but also the policies adopted to combat the virus. And we know from past recessions, like the 2008, 2009 global recession, that they have very serious effects on refugees in terms of the effects of displacement, conflict, fragile states, authoritarianism, but they also have major consequences for those displaced. They'll affect their job opportunities, they'll affect their travel opportunities, and many governments will use the pandemic as a justification to impose mobility restrictions that will affect refugees. So they're big questions, and that's, I think, the best I can do with relatively short answers. Thank you. You know, we talk about climate change, and uh, and, and and clearly, um, climate change. Uh, the, the most vulnerable communities in the world are suffering the most from climate change, from the impact of climate change, and and those are the ones who have contributed the least to what actually happens in the first place. So you can argue whether you're a refugee fee fleeing persecution, or if you are a migrant fleeing your um, community because you can't farm the land anymore, and climate change has made it impossible to live in the area where I do. They both deserve some help from us and uh, we need to find ways to do that. And this is one of the reasons why the IKEA Foundation is uh, putting a lot of emphasis on, on the climate action part and making sure that we do as much as we can over the next few years to, to curb the climate change and make sure that we also have a livable planet for, for the people who come after us. Anyway, this has been a fascinating discussion, and I'm sorry that we're running out of time. So, I'll probably agree that refugees are people just like you and me, and that's the way we have to think about it. All they want is a new chance to have a normal life, become self-reliant, contribute to society, and avoid having to live a life in constant fear. So as a global community, we have a choice to make. We can, we can either pretend they don't exist and try to close our borders and focus on ourselves, or we can uh, engage in investing in those fragile countries like uh, uh, Alex has, has described, uh, which means help address the root causes that forces people to migrate and help them build a life for themselves in the countries where they would prefer to live, the countries where they were born and raised, where they actually have their roots. We have the luxury to make that choice, and we should make it uh, carefully. Thank you to Ola and Alex for being on Ask an Expert. Really appreciate your time, and thank you to all of you who have been uh, listening in and watching in. Uh, hopefully, uh, the quality wasn't too bad, uh, and uh, then I hope to see you back soon. Yeah, thanks so much, thank Per, and really, everyone, um, the responses and the discussion on this were, I think, the most discussion I've seen on any Ask an Expert. So you guys have done a great job of getting some discussion going here. And I think it's so important, Ola, when you're talking about factfulness and really focusing on making sure that we're getting it right. And it's uh, so interesting to see how far we have to go, regardless of what you're thinking about. So thank you both for coming on. Thank you, Pear. Next week, we're back here. Uh, actually, a couple hours later, we're going to be starting at 5 p.m. CET. And we're going to be with the Home Project CEO. And that's going to be a really fascinating discussion. So I encourage you to join us. Uh, as always, thanks for tuning in to Ask an Expert. We hope to see you again next time. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you very much.